from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, my name is Mary Lou Reeker, and on behalf of the Kluge Center and the Office of Scholarly Programs of the Library of Congress, I want to welcome you to a talk by Dr. Farr Curlin entitled, Of All the Physicians, Is There a Physician? Irony in the Practice of Medicine. And before we begin, I want to remind you uh, to make sure your cell phones are off and also that if you ask a question at the end of the talk, your asking the question constitutes permission for us to record you and uh, to play that back over the web. Dr. Farr Curlin came to the Kluge Center as a David B. Larson Fellow in Health and Spirituality. This research opportunity was endowed by friends and associates of the late David Larson, an epidemiologist and psychiatrist who pioneered and stimulated critical new research intended to examine the linkages of religion and spirituality to health and healing. And we are particularly proud to have Mrs. David Larson with us here today. The current Larson Fellow, Far Curlin, is both a medical doctor and an associate professor of medicine and the founding co-director of the Program on Medicine and Religion at the University of Chicago, the world's first program of empirical research on the relationship between religion and the practice of medicine. He works with colleagues from the McLean Center for Clinical Medicine, Medical Ethics and the University of Chicago Divinity School to foster inquiry into the public discourse regarding the intersections of religion and the practice of medicine. After graduating from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, he moved to the University of Chicago, where he completed his residency in internal medicine and fellowships in both health services research and clinical ethics before joining the faculty there. Dr. Curlin has written about the moral and spiritual dimensions of the practice of medicine for journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine, the American Journal of Psychiatry, the Journal of Family Practice, the Archives of Internal Medicine and Academic Medicine. His empirical research charts the influence of physicians' moral commitments, both religious and secular, on their clinical practices. And his normative scholarship addresses how and whether physicians' religious commitments do or should shape their practices of medicine in a culturally plural and democratic society. With all that, Dr. Curlin also maintains an active clinical practice in hospice and palliative medicine. Please help me welcome him today, Dr. Farr Curlin. Thank you, Mary Lou. It's a pleasure to give this lecture. Thank you all for um, coming out on such a momentous day in American healthcare uh, to, to hear me. I, I was confused at first. I thought there was a big crowd of people who just didn't know their way here uh, and, and TV uh, stations and all, but it turns out there's something going on at the Supreme Court. Um, it has been an honor to be a, a David Larson fellow. Uh, David Larson uh, was a real pioneer in this area of religion and spirituality and health. He was one of the first people who tried to, well, didn't try to, who made a, um, an academic career and an academic uh, program out of focusing on how religious faith and religious practice uh, impacts people's health outcomes, interfaces with their practices of medicine. And uh, it's really an honor to be able to 
to hold a fellowship in his name, and it was a delight to, it's been a delight to get to know better um, uh, Susan Larson, um, his wife, who, and now widow, who I was able to have lunch with actually just a couple weeks ago. As a scholar, during these six months, I've been focusing on several projects, but one of them, and the one that's really been at my heart, has been editing a collection of papers that were written uh, by a working group of scholars that I was able to put together to address the question, what does it mean to set the practice of medicine in the context of a good and faithful life? And that the question is raised, I think, indicates how much physicians are struggling today uh, to find intrinsic meaning and reward in their work. My, my, what I'm going to present today is basically my contribution to this uh, compilation which, which addresses this question. In all corners of the profession, physicians sense that the life of a doctor is not as good or satisfying or as meaningful as it used to be. Whether or not that is true, we physicians share an anxious sense that something essential in the practice of medicine has been lost. This discontent is manifested by the fact that across the board, doctors are moving to limit their exposure to those practices historically associated with the work of physicians. In particular, the ostensibly holistic and comprehensive primary care medicine that has long been thought of as the quintessential expression of a physician at work. Physicians in training are preferentially opting for careers in dermatology, radiology, orthopedics, anesthesiology, specialties that tend to provide higher reimbursement to physicians and to carefully delimit their interactions with patients, thereby managing and mitigating the demands of medical practice. Many primary care physicians are themselves working to reduce the amount of time they spend caring for patients or are moving out of clinical practice altogether. In both ways, tacitly rejecting their practices of medicine as fitting into a good and faithful life. Now, what is going on? We tend to think we know. We tend to think that we are discontented because of decreased professional autonomy, increased bureaucratic interference, declining reimbursement, reduced length of clinical visits, soaring educational debt loads, looming malpractice claims, increasingly informed and demanding patients, soulless scientific reductionism, the electronic medical record, and the health care and affordability, well, whatever it's called. I just threw that in. Some doctors feel like uh, the movement of, of government into the management of health care, the increasing movement of government is also a part of the problem. The sense is that these and an array of other factors combine to produce the phenomenon of burnout, widespread phenomenon, an experience of alienation from and discontent with our work. And these are all familiar reasons for a collective sense that something has gone wrong and they're no doubt parts of the problem. Yet after wrestling for years with my own discontent in the practice of medicine, I've come to believe these conventional diagnoses mask a deeper problem. And if I'm right, physician discontent reflects in part a deep anxiety and a corollary sense of bewilderment. The anxiety comes from a disorienting worry that the medicine we practice today at its best may not be medicine at all. The sense of bewilderment comes from confusion about how to go on putting ourselves forward as the physicians, we do not quite know how to become. I propose that this anxiety and sense of bewilderment could be a frustrated and dysfunctional expression of irony. Irony, at least, as the concept is used by Kierkegaard and recovered by the philosopher Jonathan Lear in his new book, A Case for Irony. Now, I want to say up front, uh, that irony, and you'll, you'll, I'll explain more about this, irony as Lear and Kierkegaard use the term is not irony as we generally use the term. We generally use the term, in the way we use the term generally, we might say, for example, isn't it ironic that Chief Justice Roberts seemed to be the swing boat in upholding uh, the, the uh, Health Care uh, Reform Act, meaning something happened that was not what we expected. That's not what 
Uh, that's not how Kierkegaard and, and Lear uh, use the term irony. A closer move might be uh, if we said something like, will there be any health care in all of the health care that this law supports? It's closer, but we're not quite there. What, I, what follows, I'll describe Lear's account of irony, which is, uh, and then I'll use that account of irony to make sense of an internal conflict so many physicians experience. Our deep discontent with the way things are, combined with a painful confusion about how to go on putting ourselves forward as the physicians we long to be. I'll describe the forms irony may take in present day medicine, as well as several contemporary dynamics that seem to suppress irony, only to have it reemerge, I propose, in the form of this widespread anxious discontent with medicine. I close by proposing that physicians may need something like a religion if they are to respond to such discontent by renewing their efforts to become the physicians they are not yet, rather than detaching altogether from the quest to set the practice of medicine in the context of a good and faithful life. So how does irony come out in medicine? Irony arises from a constitutive feature of human experience, namely that to be human is to put ourselves forward in our various social roles. We put ourselves forward, for example, as parents, as students, as athletes, as worshipers, as skeptics, as scholars. We put ourselves forward as physicians. Lear notes that this putting ourselves forward necessarily implies a form of pretense. He, he writes, human self-consciousness is constituted by our capacity to pretend in this literal and non-pejorative sense. In general, we can say what we are doing, and in doing that, we are making a claim about we, what we are up to. We necessarily pretend, Lear notes, in terms of established social understandings and practices. We physicians wear white coats and beepers. We answer pages. I just answered a couple of pages right before this talk started. Uh, we ask questions of and touch patients in prescribed ways. We write out notes and prescriptions in established patterns and so on. We even depart from the conventional norms in socially established ways. Some of us forego the white coat, others the beeper. Some have stopped doing routine physical exams. All of these are socially recognizable ways of putting oneself forward as a physician. And in each case, we can give an account of what we are doing and why. Lear emphasizes that it is necessary and not to be a caricature that we put ourselves forward in these socially established ways. Yet in putting ourselves forward as physicians, we are conscious that our account of what we are doing will be incomplete. And that we may fall short of being the physicians we pretend to be. Our consciousness that we may fall short establishes the structure of what Lear calls the ironic question, among all X is there an X? Among all healthcare is there any healthcare? Among all physicians is there a physician? Among all Kluge scholars is there a scholar? Uh, where X is any human practical identity. So again, the question, among all physicians, is there a physician? What I would call the left-hand sense of physician, because you're looking at me, I'm going to use this as my left hand. Uh, uh, what I would call the left-hand sense of physician is the social pretense, and it includes all those who put themselves forward as physicians in socially established ways. What I'll call the right-hand sense of physician is that toward which the pretense aims, but inevitably falls short. Falls short. So this right, hand, this right hand sense is what a physician left hand sense would be if she fully became the physician she pretends to be. Lear notes that although the structure of the ironic question is a tautology, we don't hear it that way. We hear it as a genuine question because we recognize that there is at least a potential gap between the left and right-hand senses of all human identities and social roles. Although it would seem ridiculous to ask, among all cats, is there a cat? It seems perfectly reasonable to ask, among all physicians, is there a physician? It seems reasonable because we know implicitly that putting ourselves oneself forward as a physician in this left-hand sense does not imply living up to what it means to be a physician in the right-hand sense. The ironic question highlights these two meanings of one practical identity. Irony, Lear continues, involves two, moment, two moments, both of which are experienced in the first person. 
He writes, the possibility of irony arises when a gap open to, opens up between pretense, as it is made available in a social practice, and an aspiration or ideal, which on the one hand is embedded in the pretense, uh, and indeed which expresses what the pretense is all about, but which on the other hand seems to transcend the life and social practice in which that pretense is made. The pretense seems to at once capture and miss the aspiration. That is, in putting myself forward as a physician or whatever relevant practical identity, I simultaneously instantiate a determinant way of embodying the identity and fall dramatically short of the very ideals that I have until now assumed to constitute that identity. I should say here, by the way, that Lear is a, he's a teacher, and so in my quotations where I say physician, he actually said teacher. I've substituted different forms of uh, physician or, or medicine for teacher and teaching. In other words, with respect to medicine, the first moment of irony occurs when I become conscious of a gap opening up between how I put myself forward as a, a physician and what I would be doing if I were to actually become the physician I'm trying to be. I sense that my way of putting myself forward as a physician, though it may meet and even exceed all of the available social standards, still does not answer to medicine in this right-hand sense. Irony second and the paradigmatic moment involves what Lear calls ironic uptake. In this second moment, I am unsettled, shaken, I'm undone. Lear describes this second moment as uncanny. That which was familiar, being a physician, is rendered unfamiliar. In this ironic moment, I am faced with new and radical questions. What is health? What does it mean to heal? Who are my patients? What am I seeking when I go about doing what I do as a physician? What is all of this for? Lear writes, In this ironic moment, my practical knowledge is disrupted. I can no longer say in any detail what the requirements of medicine consist in, nor do I have any idea what to do next. I'm also living through a breakdown in practical intelligibility. I can no longer make sense of myself to myself, and thus can no longer put myself forward to others in terms of my practical identity. That I have lost a sense of what it means to be a physician is revealed by the fact that I can now no longer make sense of what I've been up to. That is, I can certainly see that in the past I was adhering to established norms of medicine or standing back and questioning them in, in recognized ways. In that sense, my past continues to be intelligible to me. But I now have this question. What does any of that have to do with medicine? And if I cannot answer that question, my previous activities now look like hubbub, busyness, confusion. I've lost a sense of how my understanding of my past gives me any basis for what to do next. That is why in the ironic moment I am called to a halt. Because of this second moment, Lear notes, Kierkegaard's ironic observation that becoming human does not come easily has less to do with the arduousness of a task than with the difficulty of getting the hang of it. To focus clearly on what irony is and to discern the forms irony may take within the practice of medicine or within, frankly, your own practices, whatever they may be, and your own identities, it's equally important to know what irony is not. And irony is not, as I said before, what most people think when they use the term. In the first place, irony is not merely consciousness that a given social pretense of medicine falls short of the aspiration toward which it aims. And putting myself forward as a physician, I may fall short because of duplicity or hypocrisy. And in that case, my pretending to be a physician is mere pretense in the pejorative sense. In this pejorative sense, one of my colleagues might say, how ironic that Farr is regarded as a good physician, when in reality, he just puts up a good front. This use of the term ironic, however, is what Kierkegaard expressly did not have in mind. Rather, Lear notes, the cases that primarily concerned Kierkegaard were not of individual hypocrisy, but ones in which the individual was an able representative of a social practice that itself fell short. In the paradigm case, therefore, the most intense irony will be experienced by the physician exemplar, by one who represents the best available social expressions of physician, the one who you would think of when you would think of when someone would ask you, do you know any good physicians? We take a step closer to irony when we recognize that becoming one of these exemplary physicians 
is not easy itself. It's not easy first because the practical identity physician includes explicit and implicit norms and commitments that are difficult to sustain. It is hard to listen to patients when one is tired and busy. It is hard to attend to the sick when, when other desires and obligations beckon. Because doing so is not easy, most of us fail to live up even to the basic socially established norms of medical practice. And the great physicians show us how far short we fall. Yet we can be conscious of falling short in this way without irony. If I merely recognize that I do not live up to the best socially established standards for medicine, I'm not unsettled so much as convicted that I must work harder to live up to those standards. In contrast, irony occurs when I recognize that I do live up to the best socially established standards. When you recognize that you live up to the best socially established standards for your role and that that's the problem. Because irony confronts me with a sense that all of the socially available standards and practices for putting myself forward as a physician fall woefully short and fall short in ways of which I yet remain unaware, irony requires more than reflection and self-critique. Lear notes, quote, the problem would not be so difficult and irony would not be so important if reflection and criticism were not already part of the social practice, end quote. Medical educators have long used a variety of means to induce in physician trainees the practices of reflection and critique. In those practices, physicians are reminded that to become and to remain a good physician is a complex and difficult task, one requiring ongoing reflection, critique, and correction. Irony, in contrast, disrupts this process of reflection with a gripping sense, a disabling sense in a way, a halting sense, that even the practice of reflecting on medicine is itself a pretense and one which may serve more to reify than to challenge current practices. For this reason, Lear notes, it is in sincere reflection that the most intense irony is possible. When I realize that my reflection carries within it a misplaced confidence that I know what it means to be a physician. To be clear, irony disrupts also my confidence that I know what is wrong with medicine and my confidence that I can see how to set it right. In that sense, when physicians experience a discontent in which they are sure what is wrong and they have a clear sense of how to put it right, that discontent is by definition not irony. It may be a justified discontent, but it's not irony. Because irony calls into question all of our social pretenses, it disrupts our usual mode of reflection, of questioning and reasoning and working our, toward our goal along tracks we recognize. It renders the familiar unfamiliar. Taken together, these descriptions of irony should also make clear that notwithstanding how the term is often misused, and this is crucial for Lear, irony involves neither detachment from social practices nor detachment from the pretense transcending aspiration toward which those practices aim. Today, a person may be called ironic who says the opposite of what he means to convey an aloof detachment from social practices. He might say, oh, I so long to become a physician or a good physician, and mean that he has no such longing at all. Alternatively, a person might say the opposite of what he means in order to convey a detached cynicism regarding the aspiration toward which the aspiration toward which the social practices ostensibly aim. In this latter sense, he might say, ironically, oh, I so long to become a physician and mean that there is nothing to long for, because to be a physician is neither more nor less than to carry out the socially established, established practices that we happen to ascribe to this socially useful role. For Lear, those who use the term irony to describe these forms of detachment contradict Kierkegaard's meaning in which only the committed are capable of irony because the non-committed cannot be disturbed by falling short of an aspiration they do not share. From the fact that irony is present, it does not follow that earnestness is excluded, Kierkegaard noted, then quipped, that is something only assistant professors assume. Irony properly understood 
leads to detachment only from the current social pretense of medicine, and only so that, so detaches from the social pretense, and only so that a more adequate social practice may be pursued. In this sense, irony is directional and directive. It always aims from the left hand to the right hand meaning of a practice or practical identity. Lear describes this directional feature of irony in which it intensifies longing for that which it renders unfamiliar as erotic uncanniness. He writes, the language that suggests itself is that of platonic eros. I'm struck by medicine, by an intimation of its goodness, its fundamental significance, and I'm filled with a longing to grasp what it is and to incorporate it into my life. I can no longer simply live with the available social understandings of medicine. If I'm to return to them, it must be in a different way. Thus, the initial intuition is that there must be something more to medicine than what is available in social pretense. Irony is thus an outbreak or initiation of pretense transcending aspiring." End quote. So as irony provokes physicians to detach from current social practices of medicine, at the same time it intensifies physicians' longing for and commitment to those practices of medicine of which the current pretenses fall short. Irony calls me to a halt, but it also spurs me on. It calls me to a halt because it reminds me that I have not yet gotten the hang of being a physician. It spurs me on because it affirms for me and lures me toward the possibility that I could become the physician I'm not sure how to become. Because irony depends on and evokes my longing to be a physician, the experience of irony should, in the paradigm case, stir me to come up with new activities or re-engage my old activities in a new way toward the end of bringing about a better practice of medicine, a practice of medicine that better fits into a good and faithful life. Several interrelated dynamics complicate, I think, the, pra the, the experience of irony in contemporary medicine. As I've already described, irony depends on and evokes recognition of the difference between my pretense to be a physician and the aspiration that transcends this and all other pretenses. Lear posits that recognizing a distinction between the left and right hand senses of one's practical identity is an inescapable feature of human experience, something that all of you, whether you philosophically endorse it or not, cannot escape. None of us can escape. Yet there are several contemporary dynamics that seem to ignore or suppress this distinction. Either by advancing the notion that medicine and physician are concepts that really only have left-hand meanings, or by focusing physicians' attention on only the left-hand meanings of these concepts, by repressing our implicit, if Lear is correct, knowledge that current practices inevitably fall short of being what they pretend to be, these dynamics, of which I'll briefly describe four, may remove the conditions necessary for physicians to move from detachment to renewed commitment, thereby leaving physicians suspended in an anxious, disorientation that irony evokes. This suspended state of anxiety and disorientation may be at the heart of physician discontent, may be, if this thesis is correct, at the heart of many people's discontent with the practical identities they inhabit, whether scholars or teachers or um, other, other sorts of practical identities. Now, the first dynamic that suppresses irony is an historical shift away from a teleological understanding of medicine. In his book, After Virtue, Alasdair MacIntyre describes a tripartite moral scheme that emerged during the classical period and reached perhaps the height of its cultural influence from the 12th century through the Enlightenment. In that tripartite moral scheme, there is uh, man as he happens to be, which contrasts with man as he could be if he realized his essential nature. And in between stands ethics, providing direction about how we might move from the first description to the second in order to, quote, realize our true nature and to reach our true end, end quote. This teleological moral framework maps well onto the features of human experience that give rise to irony. The first and second descriptions of man 
map onto the left and right hand meanings expressed in the ironic question of all the men, is there a man? Or of all the physicians, is there a physician? The goal of ethics maps onto the arrows that irony evokes, the longing to become that toward which our current practices aim but necessarily fall short. And because it maps onto the structure of irony, the scheme that McIntyre describes would seem to render ironic experience intelligible. Within that scheme, a physician would be oriented to expect disorienting moments in which he is confronted with a sense that the physician he happens to be falls short of the physician he would be if he realized the physician's essential nature. He would expect to discover in unexpected moments that he longs to, to become more fully the physician he is not yet. Yet over the course of modernity, this teleological understanding of nature in general and of medicine in particular has lost much of its cultural influence. Critics and practitioners of medicine alike are more skeptical of the notion that medicine has a telos that transcends current social imperatives. Some physicians still embrace the tripartite scheme and argue that the telos of medicine is health. Yet there's widespread disagreement about what health entails and a general worry that those who invoke a transcendent telos for medicine are merely trying to smuggle in through the back door some arbitrary and personal morality. In general, the teleological way of thinking about medicine seems to have lost its hold on the imagination of most physicians and critics of medicine, who now more often talk about uh, medicine as if it were socially constructed all the way down. Now, medicine is, of course, socially constructed. Physicians can only put themselves forward in ways available to them in their social environments. Yet it seems that to the extent physicians are trained uh, or habituated to think of their practical identity as merely socially constructed. They're left without the conditions necessary for receiving the experience of irony as a sign that there is more to medicine than medicine knows. If there is no right-hand sense of physician for which I might long and which I might pursue, I'm left without the resources to make sense of starting again in a different way. Within this way of thinking, Irony can only occur as a breaking in of recognition that the entire way of thinking is flawed. The second dynamic that diverts physicians' attention away from the right-hand meanings of medicine and physician is the way our culture has come to think of medicine principally as a scientific practice. Over the past two centuries, modern science has undergirded radical improvements in many health outcomes. That's why there's such a hullabaloo about having access to contemporary medicine. There would not have been, I would venture to say, in the middle of the 19th century when physicians didn't have much really to, really to offer you other than their, their companionship. It's no wonder then that the practice of medicine has come to be prized for extending and making good use of medical science. The problem is that the discourses and practices of the modern sciences focus entirely on this left-hand sense of reality. By definition, for only the left-hand sense of reality can be measured and counted. Insofar as our culture thinks of medicine as a scientific practice, it tends as a consequence to prioritize empirical data over clinical experience, scientific algorithms over clinical judgments, and abstracted population-level quality measures over thicker individual-level judgments about what good medicine entails for a particular patient in a particular situation. Every once in a while, someone protests, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. But the protest is weak and defeated. It's true in principle, but irrelevant in scientific practice. In the end, because the right-hand sense of medicine is not susceptible to scientific ways of knowing, the right-hand sense of medicine seems increasingly ephemeral. As medicine has become more thought of as a scientific and technical practice without an intrinsic telos, the third dynamic has emerged. Medicine has largely lost its pretense transcending aspirational moral language. The normative concepts of the doctor-patient relationship have steadily shifted toward those in which the patient acts more as a mere consumer and the physician as an expert what of healthcare services? What are doctors called now? 
provider. That's it, an expert provider of healthcare services. And in parallel, the aspirational moral language applied to physicians has shifted from notions of the virtuous or the good physician to the ethical physician to the now regnant uh, language of medical professionalism. With each of these shifts, the right-hand resonances seem to grow fainter. The language of professionalism is the residue that remains when aspirational, telos-directed notions of medicine have lost their moral mooring. The language conveys the fact that physicians retain a wistful sense of something noble about their work, but they cannot say what it is without feeling a bit sheepish and insecure. And I think the profession of medicine here reflects a broader cultural pattern that's seen in a telling way in a recent advertisement campaign for the United States Marine Corps. The campaign's motto stated, it's been pulled since, interestingly, the motto stated, U.S. Marines dedicated to a sense of honor. U.S. Marines dedicated to a sense of honor. The motto simultaneously appealed to something like irony to the listeners longing for an honor to which they're committed, but which they do not know how to achieve. While confessing that the US Marine Corps can no longer claim with a collective straight face to be dedicated to the honor for which the listener longs. A sense of honor, the social pretense, will have to do. In a similar way, the language of medical professionalism concedes that the profession has lost confidence about there being something to medicine that transcends the available social pretenses, even as the language, medical professionalism language, makes a weak appeal to physicians longing to become the physicians they are not yet. A medicine that's merely socially determined and in which specialized providers deliver scientifically refined healthcare services becomes particularly susceptible to the fourth dynamic. Medicine becomes a form of rationalized control over human bodies that is deployed according to the norms of industry and bureaucracy. In the contemporary medical literature, a steady stream of papers exhort the profession of medicine to adopt the concepts and practices of industry, including decision algorithms, safety, value, efficiency, and most prominently, quality assessment, improvement, and control. There is no irony in an industrial process or a scientific algorithm. They don't pretend to be anything other than they are. Moreover, to the extent medicine becomes structured by complex industrial, scientific, and bureaucratic systems, physicians then face another hurdle endemic to the modern age, a learned sense of helplessness in the face of the overwhelming complexity of the systems that govern social life. Making good use of irony requires a sense of possibility a sense that the gap between the current social pretense and a more robust version of the ideal can be closed in one's own experience and in response to one's own action. Irony, Lear notes, calls for a human, not a superhuman response. And yet for physicians who have learned helplessness in the face of overwhelmingly complex and powerful systems, the way forward may seem beyond their capacities and therefore, for them at least, superhuman. To the extent this is true of physician experience, the bewilderment of irony will lead only to frustration and detachment. It will contribute to the dynamics that lead physicians to burn out and give up on the quest to become the physicians they are not yet. Together, these four dynamics and their consequences erode the conditions necessary for physicians to be prepared to experience and respond well to irony. These dynamics de-emphasize the pretense transcending aspirational meaning of medicine. They make it harder, as Lear would put it, for physicians to hear the right-hand resonances of their practical identity. And when a physician does not, when the physician does hear the right-hand resonances breaking through, these dynamics make it harder for that physician to perceive a way forward by which he or she might become more of the physician they long to be. They make it harder for the physician to see a way of detaching from the current social pretense that does not involve detaching from the practice of medicine altogether. They make it harder for physicians to see a way for the practice of medicine to fit into a good and faithful life. Yet, irony remains. Although there is no irony in scientific data or industrial processes, irony is always latent 
when a physician encounters a patient. Irony is latent because individual patients exceed the categories of scientific terminology and all other socially available categories. And providing them good medicine always demands more than the bureaucratic and industrial practices of the healthcare system and all the other socially available practices. Even a hepatologist realizes on some level that his patient is not a liver. And even, ad even an advocate of total quality medicine, as it's called, knows down deep that caring for her sick patient requires more than hitting quality care benchmarks. When interacting with an individual patient, the physician is often confronted by how radically the current social practice of medicine, including his or her own best efforts, uh, how radically it falls short of being the medicine we pretend it to be. When a physician is confronted by how far medicine falls short of its pretense to heal this patient, the physician becomes susceptible then to the erotic uncanniness that Lear describes, while at the same time being compelled to new action. A sick patient reminds me that although I do not know how to begin to be a physician, I yet must put myself forward as a physician now in response to this patient. As I experience how far short my practices fall, this patient calls me out, stirring me with longing to become the physician I am not yet. As such, so long as physicians encounter individual sick patients, they will remain susceptible to irony. Because irony remains, the challenge for physicians is to be prepared to recognize irony and respond well to it, despite the dynamics described above. How can physicians respond to their discontent by detaching from the current social pretenses of medicine while recommitting themselves to become the physicians they are not yet? This question deserves a more fulsome answer than I can give here, but physicians need at a minimum concepts and practices and people that keep alive the right-hand resonances of physicians' practical identity while also giving them the resources to start again when they do not quite know how. That is to say, it seems to me that physicians may need religion or something like one. Now, lest what follows, and I'll be brief here, what follows, lest what follows appear to be special pleading for religion, I want to make three concessions in advance. First, Kierkegaard claimed that individual ignorance in the religious life is the only way to break out of the patterns of reflection that merely reify current social pretenses. And it seems that in the typical case, this religious inwardness is developed through religious social practices, even if it also depends on transcending those social practices. Yet Kierkegaard identified Socrates, rather than any uh, conventionally religious figure, as the paragon of irony. And in a case for irony, Lear makes no mention of religion. First, that's the first caveat. The second, I, I here speak necessarily of, this, of the left-hand sense or social pretense of religion, and I readily admit that the social pretense of religion has often been a formidable obstacle to ironic practice. Religious concepts and practices, being human concepts and practices, have always been susceptible to distortion and self-deception. In Kierkegaard's view, they can either prepare us for irony or they can make us perfectly sure we are onto the right path. And at their most subtle and insidious, they can make us perfectly sure that we know in what way we are not perfectly sure. Third caveat, I am not suggesting that by deploying some particular religious practice, physicians will find a cure to what ails medicine. Indeed, in using religion to fix medicine, physicians would only make religion a weak instrument in service to a strong idol. Notwithstanding these caveats, it seems that religious concepts and practices, and here I'll mention just a few, particularly uh, those in, in Christianity, which is the, my own religious uh, tradition and one I know best, uh, these practices help create the conditions necessary, although not sufficient, for physicians to respond to irony by detaching from the current pretenses while still seeking to set the practice of medicine in the context of a good and faithful life. First, by insisting on the reality, on the reality of the right-hand sense of all human practices and identities, Religious narratives make irony intelligible. Christianity cultivates an imagination seemingly charged with the expectation of irony. As Alan Verhey and Warren Kinghorn describe, this apocalyptic imagination 
sees the structuring and structural realities of our natural, cultural, social, and political existence, including medicine, as inevitably falling short of being what they were created to be and will be again one day. These powers, including medicine, powers as they're called in the, in the Christian scriptures, were created good, remain necessary for human flourishing, and yet are corrupted by sin. And in their pretense to being that toward which they aim but fall woefully short, they become tyrants. The tyranny of the current social pretense of medicine can be felt in its misplaced faith in progress and in technology and in the way it is animated by and encourages an inordinate fear of death. To the bearer of the Christian imagination, pretenses are exposed most dramatically when the ultimacy of God breaks into human experience, which occurs definitively in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which, for Hay and Kinghorn continue, restructures all of reality into this Christians call a, the theologians call a proleptic frame, so that the not yet, the right-hand sense of human existence, the good future promised by God, is now everywhere breaking into the already, the left-hand sense of human experience. According to the Gospels, this breaking in of the Christ event can be witnessed in every encounter with a patient, at least for those who have eyes to see. Let's Second, I can say more about that if folks have questions. The, the apocalyptic imagination seems to cohere with a crucial aspect of ironic experience. As irony, as irony stirs longing for a better medicine, it also mitigates against overconfidence regarding what that medicine entails. Lear writes, done well, ironic existence would be a manifestation of a practical understanding of one aspect of the finiteness of human life that the concepts with which we understand ourselves and live our lives have a certain vulnerability built into them. Ironic existence thus has a claim to be a human excellence because it is a form of truthfulness. It is also a form of self-knowledge, a practical acknowledgement of the kind of knowing that is available to creatures like us. So irony in an apocalyptic imagination, it seems to me, can both evoke a humility that is fitting to physicians whose knowledge of what medicine requires remains necessarily partial fallible and tenuous. Both insist that there is more to medicine than the available social pretenses might suggest, while also mitigating against the alter pretense to seeing clearly and completely where all of the current social practices go wrong. Yet to make good use of irony after stopping, physicians must start again. And religious concepts and practices can provide a framework that gives physicians, gives physicians the freedom boldly to start again, despite not knowing quite how. Because God's good future is guaranteed by God's faithfulness rather than by any human action, the promise of that future gives those who share in it a joyous hopefulness, uh, as for Hay and McKinney call it, which gives freedom to act even when circumstances appear hopeless. In other words, insofar as I am confident in the not yet of God's promise, I experience a freedom to act in the already. I neither despair in the face of medicine's problems nor trust too much in my solutions. And attending to the sick is a, uh, in both Judaism and Christianity and, and other religions as well, is a particularly salient way of going on despite not quite knowing how. Let me conclude. Irony disrupts and dis disorients. It leaves physicians asking what has any of this to do with the practice of medicine? And how physicians respond to irony will determine whether they renew their efforts to realize a better medicine in practice or they detach from and become cynical about medical practice as a way of living a good and worthy life. If physicians remain suspended in the state of disorientation that irony brings, if they cannot make sense of that disorientation, that disorientation can only turn to discontent. If physicians cannot make sense of why they should go on despite not quite knowing how, and if they cannot see any way to close the gap between the pretense and the pretense transcending aspiration, then their sense of alienation from the current pretense of medicine will lead them to detach altogether from the practice of medicine. If in the end I cannot see how putting myself forward as a physician might come to fit in a good and faithful life, it seems reasonable then for me to quit pretending to be a physician and instead find another practical identity. Thank you.
I think we have five minutes. Yes. Okay. So the question is, just summarizing, is, is might the way, irony, as, at least as I've described it, be something that's a product of our particular Western historical context and how we ended up here, and particularly in the way that we seem to have two sometimes irreconcilable impulses to be scientific and to be something other than scientific, uh, humanistic, uh, let's say. So if, if Lear is right, and I think Lear is right, um, irony itself is is constituent of being human. Uh, it is, you find it in every culture. Um, but it does, it does seem that the way irony is expressed and how people experience it and what they, whether they are able to do something with it, uh, what they're able to do with it, um, is culturally constrained. And, and, and so our particular context in which there is there are all these dynamics that seem to very powerfully emphasize um, the idea that medicine at its best is a ruthlessly scientific practice, while at the same time saying it's not at all to be a scientific practice, it's a healing practice, and it's to be holistic and patient-centered, may intensify, um, may make it that much more likely that when people experience inside a sense that all this stuff that I'm doing and I see other people doing all the things I even know how, what to do or how to do, they're not medicine. I, I don't think they're medicine at all. N and not know what to do with that. Because it may, it may make them that much, have that much more of a sense that this is an impossible task. This is a super, it requires something of me superhuman. I can't be both a great scientist and a great humanist. And, 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 and therefore, I'm either going to have to go choose a different practical identity, which doesn't aspire to be both. Um, or, um, or there's something wrong about the whole way that this is being structured. Yes.
Thank you for that question. It's a complicated question. Um, I would say this, it's probably not an adequate response. Um, I think Kierkegaard would ask the question, uh, he would say the irony would be, bump, be bumped up another level, which is what is, of all this love, is there any love? Of all this compassion, is there, is there any compassion? Uh, of all the ways that I know to be loving, um, are there any ways that are loving? And so I think you, part, in part your question shines a light on the fact that there can be more and less adequate social pretenses. I mean, um, to say that something is a social pretense, as he said, is not to, it's not, that's not a pejorative statement. That's just a statement about what it means to be human. Everything we do is, is going to be to put ourselves forward. Um, but, and so a more, one, one thing is we might look at the current social pretense of medicine and say there's something wrong with that. And what's wrong with that is it doesn't have love or it doesn't have real compassion. It doesn't have genuine virtue. It's not truly patient-centered. It's not motivated in the right way. Or it's not attending to fully to the complexity of the mind-body connections and so on. And one thing that would be a useful way to respond to that sort of recognition would be to try to come up with a new practice that more adequately does that. And people are doing that. And that's, that's good. I mean, those efforts are on, have to be ongoing. That's the only way we can improve. But irony works on a different level if, in Lear's understanding, which is it, would, it comes in and, and it disorients so that, so that the person who's doing all of that, and maybe an extraordinary person, would experience irony at the moment when they say, and what does any of this have to do with really creating a loving medicine? And it wouldn't be that, oh, and I know that I'm messing it up. It'd be a sense of, I don't know how to start. I do not know how to start. So what religions do, at least, and I specifically speak about Christianity in part because of this collection of papers in which there's some theological pieces from Jewish uh, scholar and from Christians, Christian theologians, um, is essentially say about the, the nature of the world and oneself that this is what you should expect, moments like this. Because the reality is that this world is made up of things that are good but which are fallen and are not yet, and will always be not yet, in this age in which we're going to live, what they are really aimed to be. And that you're going to have moments where this breaks through and you sense that this thing, medicine, being a parent, love, gratitude, is good, but it is woefully short of being what it is made to be, what it will be, ultimately. Um, and that gives you, at least, in, you know, say, in Christianity, it gives you... Um, any kind of framework in which the ironic experience, at least potentially, uh, can be received as a sign of something that, again, this reality, which gives you the freedom to just start again. Because the responsibility is not to get this right. You're never going to get this right exactly. But the responsibility is to try to move in that direction. Because this is true. This is real. This is not just your brain going off. It's not your, just your neurons firing or you know, a feeling in your gut or a social impulse that's kind of percolating through. This may be, at least it could be all of those things. It may be, though, um, an intimation of a, of a truth that you really are and a good and a value, something beautiful and worthy that you really rightly long for and should pursue. And you can start again because you don't have to get it right. If you don't believe this exists, though, and I talk about religion, if this doesn't exist, it seems to me that reasonably your gut sense that all of this has nothing to do with something that doesn't exist is a just can only be a disorienting experience because if this is not real then this is basically just a psychological process that doesn't really have an end and so it becomes less intelligible it seems to me She does not say it again? Medical school. Yeah, it's one of the top five.
Good, good question. I have had some, uh, you know, with, with, with some leaders in academic medicine. And here's an interesting thing. Across the board in the profession of medicine, people have, I mean, an absolutely widespread and, and, and uh, now taken for granted sense that there's something really missing. There's, some, there's a big hole right in the heart of what we're doing. And what, that, what people, have been, I think, have been doing for a generation is trying to fill that hole with a series of things, patient-centered medicine, narrative medicine, holistic medicine, spirituality in medicine, religion in medicine, um, uh, medical professionalism, uh, culturally competent medicine. All these things are kind of trying to say that all this science is leaving a hole, as was suggested before, um, and let's fill it. But it seems to me that the filling, and I think this would fit, Kierkegaard would, would ask the question, I'm quite sure, is all of that filling of the hole just actually a a continuation of the very process that creates the whole. And, and in a way that this reflection on trying to fill it is only reifying the whole problematic structure. It, it seems to me that spirit, the inter interest in spirituality and medicine, as it gets expressed in the conventional ways in contemporary American medical training, which is pretty widespread, most schools have something about spirituality and medicine, it seems to kind of try to fill the hole in that way, but it's naming in a way a hole that can't be filled in that way, um, and that, and this is, by the way, this is not an ironic statement, this is my assessment, you know, it could be right or wrong, but that this dynamic, uh, which has led us to think of medicine principally as a scientific practice and so on, a way of controlling the body to get outcomes that, in, that we desire, is the problem. And no, no, no matter of, no amount of layering on, you know, things to kind of round it out, smooth it off, or fill in the hole is going to fix the problem. Yeah. To be God. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> Yeah, we have created around physicians, I, I put it this way, um, uh, I don't think many physicians are thinking of themselves as godlike anymore, if they ever did. I know that was a certain um, trope anyway that probably had some truth to it. Um, they, but what we are, have created around physicians is an expectation that they're going to deliver us from what it means to be embodied mortal creatures, suffering, debility, decline, and death. And we have a very anxious, as a people, uh, desire for physicians to deliver us from all, the, all that that implies. And, um, and physicians are caught up in providing what people long for. And, and, and so there's a kind of back and forth, in a way, codependent relationship there. Um, and that is part of the problem, I think. Again, that's, that's not a statement of irony. Irony, again, does, irony, by the way, I'll make clear, irony makes no argument about what the problem is. It's just a feature in which you, you can be confronted with the sense that, there, that all, the different, all the different categories and all the different answers that are out there fall woefully short. We, you know, there, this is, all that we're trying to do is something that falls far short of what we want to do, and we're not sure exactly how to get going again. But I do think, reflectively, that that is a part of the problem. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.